Spanish voters went to the polls nearly three months ago, and still the country is without a formal government. The clock is ticking. Can enough parties come together to form a coalition? Or is Spain limping towards yet another election? Hello and welcome to Roundtable. I'm Enda Brady. Now, Spain's right-wing parties tried and failed. It's now up to the left to wrangle enough seats to make up a majority. But is any deal worth breaking the deadlock? Or would sidling up to separatists be a step too far? Thousands took to the streets in Barcelona earlier this month. They're angry about a possible amnesty deal that could see Catalan separatist leader Carles Puigdemont return to mainstream politics. No one can prevail over the law. Puigdemont faces disobedience and embezzlement charges and has been living in Belgium since 2017 after he helped organize the unauthorized Catalonia independence referendum. In order to piece this together, let's go back to the July 23rd election. Each color represents the number of seats won by each party in Spain's proportional representation system. The biggest winner, with 136 seats, is the right of center Popular Party. But two months after the election, it failed to get the 176 seats required to form a government. As the required majority has not been reached, and consequently, the confidence of the parliament for the investiture has not been achieved. The task now falls to incumbent Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez to try. His Spanish Socialist Party won 122 seats. It's set to partner with the left-wing Sumar Party, bringing the total to 153. Sanchez now has to appeal to a variety of smaller, more fringe parties to achieve the magic 176. That will mean wooing Carles Puigdemont together for Catalonia Party and its seven seats. He has conditions. The complete and effective abandonment of the judicial process against independence and pro-independence. October 1st is not going to be a crime. So amnesty for himself and his supporters, which sparked protests around the country. And he wants another referendum on Catalonia independence, a legitimate one, sanctioned by Madrid. Prime Minister Sanchez has indicated this is a line he is not prepared to cross, but if he wants the backing of Catalan and other separatists, there will be compromises. So what will the socialists risk to avoid another election and stay in power? Well, let's meet our guests in Newport, Wales, is Andrew Dowling, a reader in Hispanic studies at Cardiff University. In Barcelona, in Spain, is Gufre Jordan, a journalist for Catalan News. And joining me here in the studio is Pablo Calderon Martinez, Associate Professor in Politics and International Relations at Northeastern University, London. Pablo, I'll come to you first. What are people at street level saying about this political impasse? Well, I think that pretty much it depends who you're asking and where you're asking in particular. But I think the general feeling is a little bit of deja vu. Here we go again. We've been here in the past. And this idea that, you know, I think people want to move on. I think the worst outcome would probably be uh, another election. Uh, I think people are really to move on. Uh, and I think particularly because of the nature of the previous election, the election we had a couple of months ago that was so, uh, the, the, the quality of the debate was really low, right? And it was really a, a, an issue of cultural politics. So I think people are ready to move on. Uh, and they're hoping, they're looking forward, I think, the majority at least, I think, to, to a government, whatever it may be, and move on with our lives. Gofrey, if I could come to you. Pablo says the quality of the debate was really low. Is that a good assessment? Uh, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, um, if you follow all the parliamentary discussions in the Spanish Congress in Madrid, uh, sometimes it, it looks like a playground uh, uh, from school. And, and I think, yeah, so the arguments and the tactics from one and the other side, left and right wing parties, are quite low and you know so proposals or ideas or suggestions never come up so it's always like trying to criticize the other part and trying to come up with super harsh words and so on and this doesn't do any good 
uh, to Spanish politics because now we've got a hung parliament and both sides, left and wing, uh, left and right, are incapable to to work together because they are clashing all the time. So, Andrew, just how has Spain got itself into a position like this? Just complete deadlock. Well, I think one thing um, to be aware of in general terms is there's been very strong polarization um, in Spain for, you know, probably going back 20 years now. So there's less and less kind of like accommodation in between sort of left and right. I think one very important thing is a very strong media space in Madrid that's um, conservative dominated television and newspapers. And, and they kind of like, you know, it's part of these themes of populism that are happening elsewhere around the world. We see an intensification of political dispute um, that is ongoing in Spain. So it's very hard to to find broad compromises. I think that that's that's basically why we are where we are today. Pablo, I want to look at the main players here. Alberto Nunes Feijo, his party actually won the most seats and he's not getting a chance to form a government. Is he right to feel perhaps a bit aggrieved about everything? I mean, I think they did get a chance. He just couldn't do it simply because the numbers are not there. And that is just the nature of parliamentary democracy. Everybody knows the rules and you play by the rules. He couldn't form a government mainly because he couldn't find any allies other than the far right Vox party. Uh, he played his cards. He couldn't make it. And that's the way it is. That's the rules of the game. Now, there's another path for the socialist party to try to make a coalition. Uh, so I think he has some reason to be aggrieved. But again, this isn't a presidential system where the person that gets the most votes simply gets to be the president. It's parliamentary democracy, and you have to follow the rules of parliamentary democracy, and you have to have the support of parliament, and he simply does not have the numbers in parliament to become the, the next government, and, and that's just simply the way it is. So, quite frankly, he can't do the deals to get himself into power? No, I think once you bring Vox into the equation, that pretty much means that you cannot make agreements with anybody else. Because Vox, as thing we've seen, is a toxic political party. And I think now the PP is going to find it very, very hard to convince any other party, particularly the regional parties, to come into a formal alliance with Vox on the same boat. That is very, very hard. He tried, he failed, and I don't see any way around it. And the only possible chance for Feijó to come to government is if there is a, another election in the next few months. Gofre, looking at something that Feijó said recently, he said... Gridlock does not benefit Spain. Do you think there's any way this could possibly benefit him now in the next few weeks at all? Well, I mean, as Pablo was saying, uh, well, the only way that could be, you know, a good scenario for him is repeating the election. So, of course, for him now, that look is somehow beneficial. If, uh, if the left-wing parties... Um, headed or led by the Socialist Party are unable to form a government. That's probably bad for uh, residents, Spanish residents, but good for him because the election would uh, would repeat. So he would have like a second go in order to 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 try to garner this uh, right wing majority that he failed to to achieve on July the twenty third uh, when the last Spanish election was held. Andrew. Pedro Sanchez is often described as a political gambler. Do you think his luck is going to continue now? Yeah, I, th I, th I think I think in gen in general that it's more likely than not we will see um, a socialist-led government. Um, you can't guarantee it, but I think the um, in terms of what the Spanish so Socialist Party want and their potential allies, neither of those two blocks, if you want the regionalist nationalists on one side and the Spanish Socialists and Sumar on the other, none of those blocs want a new general election because it would be a very risky strategy that could open the door to a new uh, Conservative government led by Fejo. So, therefore, there is the, the, the push, there is the potential to establish an agreement. Now, it won't be easy, and I think um, over the next few weeks we'll probably see many moments where perhaps these negotiations might break down. But ultimately... And I think that's why I state it. Ultimately, there is more in common with these two blocks to, to establish a new form of administration than run the risk of not being in the same strong position, particularly for the Catalan pro-independence forces. A new general election could reduce their influence, et cetera, et cetera. So they've got a window of opportunity. Both sides have got a window of opportunity. And that's why it's very much a make or break moment for them. I'm intrigued by this opinion poll that was recently in El País, the national newspaper in Spain. 
48% of those polled said they would rather have new elections. 41% said they would prefer some sort of coalition. So the majority of people in Spain want to go again? It looks like it, possibly, uh, but I think it depends as well of the majority of people probably that voted conservative would rather go for a second election because, of course, that is the only way anybody from a conservative-leaning position are going to get into government. So, yeah, you could say all those people on the right would like a new general election. Uh, and at the end of the day, Spain has proven yet again that it's fairly evenly split between left-wing and right-wing, and that's been a historical problem in Spain. I agree with Andrew that the problem is that the both sides are getting more polarized, right? But it's not necessarily that there is a clear majority to the left or to the right. And that is the main problem. The issue here is, if you repeat the election, I think the likelihood is you're going to have a very similar outcome. I cannot see Vox drastically increasing his vote or the PP drastically increasing his votes. By the same token, I can see the socialists drastically increasing. So it may be that you repeat the election and you end up with a very similar position or even a worse one when there are even more difficult arithmetic per vote sides. So there is no guarantee that repeating the election is going to break the deadlock. I think there is also a possibility that it may increase it and make it even worse. So your reading of it is this is hopeless deadlock. I don't think it's necessarily a hopeless deadlock. I still agree, I I still agree that it's likelier to be a path for government for the Socialist Party and for Pedro Sanchez to continue. I think that's a likelier outcome. I think all the parties involved, that's what they want to see. And I think they're all going to get their key priorities over the line, particularly the Catalan nationalists who are probably going to get their, their main objective, which is armistice for um, um, political parties for, for the leaders of the independence movement. I think it's going to be controversial. It's going to be a difficult decision. Even within the Socialist Party, there's a lot of opposition. I think Felipe Gonzalez, the spiritual leader of the Socialist Party, has said repeatedly that he's against it. But eventually, it's all about being capable of forming government. And only the Socialist Party at the moment is capable, is in a position, to form government. Uh, so I think that's what's going to end up happening. Well, just on that point, let's go to Catalonia and Gofre. The potential kingmakers here, you know, the Catalan parties, if they were to go into coalition with Pedro Sánchez, what do you think they will be asking for in return? Yeah, their main demands, uh, they've already stated these demands. And as Pablo was saying, the main one is to get this amnesty for uh, those, for any individual who has, who is facing a legal case, an open, open or even closed legal case uh, related to all the 2010s uh, independence push. You know, um, our audience, if, if, if they don't know, uh, basically in Catalonia, in the whole 2010s, uh, there was some uh, independence discussion, heated discussion. And uh, in the end, in 2017, the Catalan government decided to organize a referendum, an independence referendum, even though this was uh, not authorized by Spain. So the whole thing ended up in, uh, you know, Spain taking over Catalonia of rule, um, jailing half of the Catalan government while the other half uh, of ministers went to uh, exile. Actually, They're, they fleed basically from, from Spain in order to avoid uh, imprisonment. So this is still open. And what this part is one, what the pro-independence part is one, is for these cases to be filed, you know, to, to be dismissed by, by courts. And that's the main demand. And I would just say a couple more demands. They want uh, more influence of or more presence of the Catalan language. Um, I think one of the most important things would be getting Catalan language, the status of official language uh, at the EU level. That is not happening at the moment and they want to achieve that. And well, in general, they would like uh, an authorized independence referendum. If they get their way and exile leaders come home, like Carles Puigdemont, currently in Belgium, will, will that really kind of add fuel to the fire, if you like, of Catalan independence and start that ball rolling again? It could happen. Uh, at the moment, as I said, so this, this, whole, uh, this whole independence push ended or peaked in 2017 with the, with the independence referendum. And since then, it's been like more quiet, let's say. Everything has slowed down. Probably pro-independent supporters um, are, you know, uh, not convinced anymore that independence is possible. Parties 
are not cooperating, like pro-independence parties within the pro-independence camp, they are not cooperating, they are all the time uh, disputing, um, having uh, disputes among them. And a potential return of this former Catalan president, Carlos Puigdemont, who was the uh, the leader of uh, that independence referendum in 2017, uh, would this reignite the whole thing? It could happen, it could happen, but I'm not that convinced. So he remains like the main symbol for, for the pro-independence camp. This is, I think, not arguable. So he remains the top figure. But again, people have seen how complicated it is to, you know, to, to achieve independence, you know, and, and a big chunk of pro-independence supporters have realized that they need to be more, you know. So uh, at the moment, it's like 50-50 or even a bit less than 50 for for the yes option, let's say. Uh, so I'd say, um, you know, I'm, I'm not super convinced that the whole uh, heated debate on independence would automatically return. Andrew, would happen, though. I mm -hmm. want to bring Andrew in. Andrew, how difficult a dance is this for Pedro Sanchez, you know, reaching out potentially to form a coalition with Catalan parties and Basque parties, and yet knowing that the rest of Spain will be watching this very, very closely? Yeah, I mean, you know, Pedro Sanchez has, has does kind of do this. He does stick his neck out. And I think, you know, there are two strands to the demands of Catalan independence. One is the amnesty, as we've we've already heard mentioned. And, and the second thing is a referendum on self-determination. A referendum on self-determination is not going to happen um, in any meaningful sense. There will be no binary yes, no, um, you know, referendum agreed by the government in Spain. That is not going to happen. That is just not a plausible um, scenario at present. I think I'd also add that, um, in, in my view, the Catalan independence movement is actually on a bit of a downward spiral. It has diminished capacity to mobilise in the street. It's got diminished social pressure. There's also been some interesting data on young people's attitudes. So basically people under 25, 30 who are less and less mobilised around the cause of independence. So any notion that there's some kind of inevitability about independence is not really plausible. But the other side of that, of course, is that the portrayal of Pedro Sánchez in Madrid is somebody who's selling out the fatherland. This very intense media, political, economic space that kind of like, you know, dominates the language, dominates political discourse, will it will read any concessions to the forces of Catalan independence as Pedro Sánchez essentially being as a traitor to the Spanish fatherland, as a, as a traitor to the unity of Spain, even if the actual concessions are, are fairly kind of like mainstream, fa fairly conventional in terms of amnesty or greater rights for the Catalan language, which we've already seen actually in the, uh, the Madrid parliament. So I think we, you're going to have to distinguish between reality and how that reality is framed by this kind of media scape centred in Madrid. Pablo, how does he square that off then? It's quite a phrase, isn't it? Selling out the fatherland. He's trying to build a coalition, keep a government going, get back into power, and effectively being seen as a traitor. Yeah, I think by this stage, he's probably used to it, right? I think that's the main attack of the PP and the Partido Popular has been attacking Pedro Sanchez over this over and over and over and over again. And I think it sticks and it's efficient in certain circles as well. But I also think many people in Spain can see through the rhetoric and can see through this thing and understand that certain compromises are, to an extent, inevitable. Uh, that doesn't mean it's an easy position to be in. And again, I think Pedro Sanchez's mistake in the previous election was that he let that particular debate dominate the election and it all became about basically culture wars and the war about who's selling the fatherland to whom and all these sort of questions, right? And at the end of the day, I think most Spaniards realize that actually, if you look at it in the terms of the record of the socialist government of the last few years, it hasn't been that bad. It managed to, economically in particular, managed to handle the, the, the crisis because of the war in Ukraine relatively well. Uh, it increased its presence internationally as well. I think the majority of people in Spain, I'm sort of in favor of some of the social reforms mm -hmm. as well of the left-wing coalition. So I think Pedro Sanchez is very able and capable of navigating this sort of negative media and again, the problem is when Pedro Sanchez wants to lower his own discourse and start fighting the right in the same discourse of, well, it's not who, me who is the traitor, you're the traitor, and then it becomes a screaming match. And that is precisely what the Partido Popular wants it to be. 
uh, because he has more sort of weapons in that sense. But I think if Pedro Sanchez can manage to make any possible debate and any possible election, any possible coalition about actually the real outcomes and what is best for the country, I think he has a very good argument to be made there about, you know, we need stability, we need continuity, and we really need to get moving forward, particularly because the economy is not doing that badly, but it's in a, pre a precarious situation, right? And Spain is, has the presidency of the European Council. So there's all these things that need to be sort of continued. You have to be very, very careful. And I think that's the argument Pedro Sanchez should take forward. You mentioned the economy, Pablo. Well, let's take a look at it. Spain's economy expanded more than expected at the end of last year, a sign of resilience, really, in the face of high inflation and rising borrowing costs. And it's expected to expand more subduedly this next year. Spain's GDP grew to 5.5% in 2022, expected to reach 2.2% this year and perhaps 1.9% next year. Inflation rose to 8.3% in 2022, expected to reach 3.6% by the end of this year and 2.9% in 2024. Gofre, what's your reading of the Spanish economy at the moment? I mean, cost of living crisis across Europe. What are average Spaniards saying to you and Catalans when you talk to them in the street? One of the things that probably worries the most uh, and, you know, among population is two things. Basically, the cost of living, like going to a supermarket, the price of things, you know, inflation has reached uh, double figure numbers uh, in 2022. So it, it peaked at 10 or 11 percent. Uh, that was, you know, unprecedented figures in, in the past few decades. And that's on the one hand, so that's what worries the most uh, people probably. And on the other hand, housing, you know, housing is another um, concern. Uh, rents, for instance, rents, especially in cities, are skyrocketing. So in, in the past few years, it's been, it's been incredible how uh, quickly prices have gone up ever since the 2008 uh, financial crisis. So uh, these are the two things that the Spanish government is handling, and I wouldn't say they are completely handling it properly because they've done loads of, they've made loads of efforts. But there's still, you know, housing is still something that is yet to be tackled, and and the cost of and the cost of living. It's true that it doesn't only depend on Spain. It also depends on this geopolitical um, context. Andrew, can I ask you for your prediction? What do you think is going to happen in the coming weeks in Spain? Go on, put yourself out there. Give us a prediction. Yeah, well, I mean, if, if I was a betting man, I think that a new um, government will be formed, socialist-led. That You know, I'd, I'd put not a, a large amount of money on it, but I think that's more likely than not. But I also think one of the things just to, to, to as a sort of byproduct to some of this discussion about the economy, I think it's also very important to note that if that does happen, Pedro Sanchez's new government will have less capacity to introduce what we would call progressive social reform because the, um, a big block on the Catalan side and an important block on the Basque side are quite conservative in terms of their economic policy. And so there won't be the same opportunities for a new socialist led um, coalition government to introduce some of the measures that it's introduced in the previous administration. So there'll be less capacity to make some of these generous, uh, measure, ge generous measures more widely available because there'll be resistance within the broader coalition. And I think that's something that will absolutely be something to watch out for. Pablo, what do you think is going to happen in your country? Um, I think it's very interesting. Um... I think I agree with Andrew that the likelier outcome is that we're going to have a socialist coalition of sorts. And I think if it was any other country, I mean, in the UK, Rishi Sunak would kill for those sort of economic data. And he'll be very happy with that. And he would call an election tomorrow if it was backed by that sort of economic figures, right? So in any other country in the world, I would say, you know, this would signify and this would mean uh, an easy win, perhaps, right? Particularly in the context of wider Europe what's going on in the world. So I still think the likelier outcome is that the socialist government, the socialist party, and Pedro Sanchez are going to find some path to governments. I agree it's not going to be the easiest government and the easiest uh, next few years for the government, but I still think they'll be able to introduce enough of the reforms that have a, a clear mandate 
And most importantly, Vox is always going to be there in the background, making sure that everybody gets in line and reminding people of what happens if this coalition falls apart. So I think that's going to be a very good incentive and a very important incentive for all political parties to come together and form a new government. And just briefly, the EU presidency, it's been a success for Spain? I think it's happening a lot and a lot has happened. Uh, and I think, again, I think that helps Spain in some ways. And I think that helps Pedro Sanchez individually to look more presidential, to, mo to look more statesman-like, because he's dealing with these big issues and he's dealing with this crisis. And that is always good news for the electorate. And the electorate like to see their president involved in these sort of issues. So I think that is, for Pedro Sanchez politically, that is very successful and that is a good set of events. Uh, if it's going to be good in general, only time will tell. Pablo, Gufre, Andrew, thank you all for your insight. Remember, you can see more discussion and debate on our YouTube channel. Search for Roundtable TRT World. But for now, from me, Enda Brady, and all of the team here, goodbye and thank you for watching.